Hello everyone and welcome to NG IB Preparation. Today, in under 10 minutes, we're going to go through every single IB economics diagram that you need to know. First, we have a normal supply and demand diagram where the intersection is the microeconomic equilibrium where we see the market clears basically quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. But let's say we had an increase in the demand curve to the right. If this is the case, then we have probably excess demand at the same price that the equilibrium was previously at because now that demand is increased, that means that consumers prescribe more utility to the good. So to reach equilibrium again, price has to increase. A similar thing happens if suddenly we have an increase in supply as we see from S to S1. Now because there's more supply this leads to downward pressure on the price. If price stays the same then we have an excess supply or a surplus. So for us to reach equilibrium again for the market to clear we need a decrease in the price. If we want to show that there's been a tax, a tax represents an increase in the cost of production for a firm so therefore the supply curve has to shift to the left and therefore this leads to a deadweight loss because of inefficiency and also a government tax revenue which is the rectangle here. The tax burden is not distributed equally and actually we see here that the upper part of the rectangle is the consumer burden and the lower part is the producer burden so basically what the producer and consumer have to pay in terms of the proportion of the tax and the rule is is that if PED is more elastic than price elasticity of supply then the producers will bear a greater proportion of the tax burden. A subsidy on the other hand is simply the opposite of a tax because it's a grant made by the government to producers in order to lower their cost of production so the supply curve actually shifts to the right. This also leads to an inefficiency or an efficiency loss as shown by the deadweight loss because it's a government intervention and the entire rectangle is the amount of money that the government has to pay in order to finance this subsidy. Price controls, on the other hand, are also a form of government intervention, but it's when the government sets a specific price, either above or below the equilibrium. If this uh, price is above the equilibrium, then it is a price floor, and if it is set below the equilibrium price, then it is a price ceiling, and this leads to different things. So as we see here, the price floor leads to higher quantity supplied than quantity demanded, so a surplus, and a price ceiling leads to higher quantity demanded than quantity supplied, so an excess demand. Both of these leads to a deadweight loss, because again, it's an intervention. And now market failure. So market failure occurs because we do not achieve allocative efficiency, likely because of the divergence or the difference between private and social costs and benefits. So in the case of a negative externality of production, the private costs of producing something are lower than the social costs of producing something, such as like fossil fuels, which are bad for pollution. And this leads to the overproduction of a good. If we have a negative externality of consumption, the private benefits of consuming something are greater than the social benefits, such as in the case of cigarettes and secondhand smoking. Positive externalities occur when a good is underconsumed or underproduced, so the societal benefits of consuming or producing a good are greater than the private benefits. So we can have a positive production externality, which means that the societal cost of producing something is lower than the private cost of the personal producer, and a positive externality of consumption when the benefit of you consuming something is greater for society than it might be for you. Monopoly power or price setting ability is also a type of market failure because monopolies or oligopolies, they both have um, the ability to set price and so they set the price too high and they underproduce in order to make profits and this also leads to a deadweight loss. Now for theory of the firm. So in theory of the firm we have the cost curve, we have total fixed costs which always remain the same regardless of output, the total variable cost and the total cost and the distance between the total variable cost and the total cost is total fixed cost. You can also draw the average cost curve, so total fixed cost, um, this should be average variable cost, sorry, marginal cost, average cost, and average variable cost. For the revenue curves, however, they're not the same, they depend on the market structure, so for perfect competition we have a perfectly elastic demand curve, AR curve, and MR curve, and price curve, they're all the same thing, simply because the, the firm is a price taker, not a price maker. If we draw the AC curve underneath the AR curve, then that means, in this case, that the firm is making a profit. For imperfect competition, there's MR, AR, AC, MC, in this case, again, AC is below AR, so they are making an abnormal profit. So here we were drawing the average revenue curves, here we draw total revenue curves, and for perfect competition, total revenue is a straight line curve, whereas for imperfect competition, it is a slightly curved, it's not straight. Here you can also tell whether the firm is making abnormal, normal, or a loss, because um, if total cost is below total revenue, then it is an abnormal profit, but where TC and TR intersect, that is normal profit. If you want to show economies of scale or the longer and average cost curve, then you can just use this curve. And now we can start with macro. So the first curve in macro is the circular flow of income where we have households and firms and we see that firms give households goods and services and in return households give firms spending and households also give firms their factors of production so like labor and land and in return firms give them income so wages. But we also have leakages and injections. So injections would be things like government spending, investment and exports whereas leakages to the circular flow of income would be savings, taxes and imports. 
The business cycle is meant to show that over time we see fluctuations, short-term fluctuations in actual GDP, but overall long-term growth trends. It's supposed to show the downturns and upturns in economic activity. Now for aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So the neoclassical model of aggregate demand and aggregate supply uses LRS, SRS, and AD because it does see a difference between the short run and long run aggregate supply. Here I'm showing you an inflationary gap where actual GDP or real GDP is above YF. YF is the full employment level of output. It is always where LRS intersects the x-axis. For the Keynesian model, however, there is no difference between the short run and the long run. Actually, we only have one aggregate supply, which is curved, and AD. Here we also have a full employment level of output, which is when AC becomes perfectly vertical. Here I'm showing you a deflationary gap because actual real GDP is below YF. Now for inflation. So inflation is always an increase in the price level, but there are two different times. We have cost push inflation, which is a result of A is shifting to the left, and a decrease in real GDP at the same time. And then we also have demand pull inflation, which is when AD increases and therefore price level also increases. Deflation is a decrease in the price level and can be good or bad. So good deflation happens as a result of AS shifting to the right and it also increases real GDP. But there's also bad deflation, which happens when there's a decrease in AD and a decrease in the price level. If you're asked about income distribution, then you use the Lorentz curve. So the Lorentz curve plots percentage of population over percentage of income, and this line here is the line of perfect equality. So the situation where exactly 20% of the population, say, earn 20% of the income. However, most countries have a Lorentz curve that is unequal. If you want to calculate the Gini coefficient using the Lorentz curve, you simply do A over A plus B. Now for international trade. So assuming that there is free trade, all we have to do is draw the domestic supply curve, domestic demand curve, and then the world supply curve underneath. The difference between what is supplied domestically and what is demanded domestically is filled in by imports and all of this triangle area in orange is the consumer surplus, the lower part is producer surplus. If I am talking about tariffs, then all I have to do is shift the world supply curve up by the extent of the tariff, and now we see that domestic supply increases from QS to QS1, while demand decreases because now the price has gone up from WS to WS plus T. We also see that there is inefficiency loss, which are the triangles, there's tax revenue gained, however, and there's an increase in producer surplus, however, all of that area is lost in consumer surplus. If I wanted to draw a quota, it would be the exact same diagram. The only difference is that the area of tax revenue for a quota is not gained because it is not a tax. Instead, it is unexpected windfall gains, which is basically an increase in the revenue of foreign producers if price goes up more than quantity decreases. For a subsidy, it is a shift of the supply curve to the right because now costs of production are lower. This leads to a deadweight loss because, then again, it is inefficient. And there's also a government subsidy bill, so how much the government pays for the subsidy. For the exchange rate diagram, it's really simple. Your y-axis is simply whatever currency you're talking about in terms of another currency, because that's the definition of an exchange rate, and then it's supply of the currency and demand. And last but surely not least, I left PPC for last because I felt that there was more to talk about. For example, the slope of the PPC covers the opportunity cost of producing one good in instead of another. The x-axis is good x, the y-axis is good y, but in reality, the PPC only represents the potential that the economy has to produce either of these goods if it uses all of its resources in reality because of the unemployment of resources most countries all countries will be producing within the pbc curve instead which is area a and we see that area a is inefficient because i could produce more of good x or good y without forsaking the other good and so i'm losing so um, a movement from point a to point b would be an increase in actual growth whereas a shift of the pbc curve outward would be an increase in potential growth so as a result of like um, new technology innovation and these are all the diagrams that you need to know in order to score highly on your economics papers. I know I went through these very, very quick. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment and I will make videos to dive deeper into um, analyzing and drawing each of these diagrams. But thank you for watching.